but I don't see the solution for healthy skin being topical at all. It's definitely, I think what appears at skin level is probably the very last point of a, a long chain of events going on, you know, either deeply rooted in the gush or something skewed in your hormones. Um, and the skin is just the last place for it to appear. Um, and I think, A, if you use the type of products that are only going to suppress that, it's just an outward symptom of inner stuff. So whether it be acne and just throwing, you know, retinol at it or whether it be eczema and just throwing cortisone creams at it, um, then you're missing, well, A, you're missing that opportunity to say, oh, thank you, skin, you're telling me something. Something's not going on on the deeper level. So, yeah, that cortisone cream might, you know, turn that eczema off, but that whole chain of events leading up to that eczema is still happening. And what else is that going to lead to down the track? Welcome to The Body Never Lies. I'm your host, Leela Lutz. Each week, myself and experts from around the world help you uncover the secret ways your body communicates with you to empower you in your own individual health journey. Skincare has to be one of the biggest industries turning over multi-millions, billions, trillions, I reckon, of dollars per year. I would also say that it's one of the industries that's full of the most BS and praise on the vulnerabilities of both women and men and you know I often find clients are doing more harm than good with their skincare regime but even if it's an aging issue or a condition like eczema, rosacea, melasma, pigmentation and the like to me the skin is one of the biggest messengers in our body and remember the body never lies. Today, my guest is a nutritionist and a businesswoman, Emma Skorakis. Uh, she's the owner of Saturay with Kitty Bloomfield. And in the wake of Saturay launching their new skincare line, I really wanted to put her in the hot seat and ask her all about the skin from a nutritionist perspective, but also from someone who has spent the last three years researching and developing a product in the midst of an industry preying on that vulnerability of ours of what's happening to our face. Today, we're going to talk about how the body never lies about what's going on with our skin. Hi, Emma. Thank you so much for coming on The Body Never Lies. And today we're going to talk all about everything, the myths of skin. <laughs> that sounds dramatic. <laughs> it did sound dramatic. <laughs> Would make oh, this really controversial. <laughs> I know. Well, it's funny because I've just had so many people asking me questions about. I think it's one of it's something that people think about a lot, right? Like women are very conscious, and men, but I think women. I get the most questions about it from women, and it's a multi-billion-dollar industry, right? Skincare. Oh, it's massive, and I, and I think perhaps maybe you know, your your listeners and my clients are the type to maybe dig in that little bit deeper. And once you become conscious of things like the ingredients in your food, and dissecting that, I think the natural progression is, well, what else is in my pantry and what else am I cleaning my house with and what am I rubbing onto my tissue? I mean, mm. a percentage of that will make, you know, penetrate into your bloodstream as well and it becomes you. So, it makes sense to look closely at ingredients as well and and it starts to blow your mind. I mean, we've been, as we'll discuss, you know, embarking on trying to make skincare for the past three years, formulation process, and the more you figure out which ingredients you do want and realise the ones you don't want, you start to look closely at all the mainstream products and how much rubbish is in them. It's just incredible. Mm, it's crazy, right? It's so crazy. Yep. yep. So. What can I just get because this is the first time that you've been on the body never life? <laughs> can I just get a little bit of a backstory about you and how you came to be in the space that you're in today? The short version. Okay. The short version. Um <laughs> where do we begin? <laughs> uh I picked up my first book about nutrition when I was I think I was eight or nine when I had sort of gut issues as a baby and it always sort of um was quite unsettled. And a naturopath instilled in me that you are what you eat. And I thought that was just mind blowing as a little girl. And I did, I sort of literally was dissecting different types of eating and traditional eating and diets and things right through my teenage years and probably did too many 
experiments that perhaps we've all done when you get a bit fascinated by nutrition. Then, um, yeah, after uni, I went back again. I studied Chinese medicine, nutrition, and went between all those sort of genres and then looked into every kind of diet out there, I suppose, being my own experiment along the way. But it wasn't till about 11, 12 years ago after, um, gosh, I'd been, I'd been to America working with experts in certain fields of cleansing and all that, that sort of realm and, and it just didn't, I didn't feel that I was thriving from it and I started to question all those methods as well. And then by chance I came across the work of Broda Barnes and Ray Peat and that whole, you know, that whole um, group of geniuses and it blew my mind. And from the minute I started applying it on myself and generally with clients, all of a sudden I started to see people mm. actually heal and actually feel good. And it was like this is working and this makes more sense than anything I've been taught at university. So that was that was very exciting. But then, as you probably found too, the more you dig into this whole topic, you realise how probably unnecessarily overcomplicated it's become mm. and perhaps the things that, you know, our grandmothers and our great-grandmothers were already doing is what we should have probably stuck with all along the way and how simple it can be, which I found quite freeing rather than having to source foods from you know across the world and soak this and activate that and all the things that I don't know maybe we're missing the point of what's accessible what we can grow ourselves what's local um you know simple course cooking methods and yeah just I suppose grounding and simple ways of living again mm. And so, and so now you're you're in this business with Kitty. You guys are amazing business yeah. partners. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Well, we try. Um, well, I've been as a practitioner privately for now, maybe fifteen, sixteen years, maybe more. Um, and worked with Kitty. She was a client of mine, maybe seven, seven or so years ago. And, yeah, we sort of spoke the same language. She does great work on a sort of a larger scale with groups and the kind of teaching they do, and I do more than one-on-one stuff. Um, yeah, and all along the way we sort of started to see how what we did worked well together. Often she'll send clients to me and vice versa. But a few years ago now I remember we were both getting a similar question from our clients, the ones who I might have spent six months with the clients and saying, from the ground up, helping them relearn about their body, about their physiology, about what foods perhaps suit them, help them read their bodies better. And they've made all this progress with their food. And then eventually, like we were saying before, you know, they'd start to go, well, I'm becoming really conscious of the ingredients in my food. But then it comes to mind that I might get out of the shower and I'm slathering my body with Nivea body lotion. And I've noticed that, oh, all those things I'm trying to avoid in my food are in there plus other things I can't pronounce, is it important when I rub on my skin? And you go, well, yeah, absolutely. And then they'd say, well, what brands of skincare do you recommend? And, you know, there was the odd one here or there or not necessarily readily accessible in Australia. But um, apart from, you know, the simplest thing being, you know, hacking at a tub of coconut oil, which gets a bit grimy and slimy and a bit hard in the winter too, um, yeah, there wasn't something we could wholeheartedly recommend or uh, get hold of for them so yeah kitty got at me and said we need to make skincare like everyone just keeps asking give us mm. give us some ideas and we need to make skincare and I thought oh god that sounds like <laughs> you know a big ask but we um yes yeah, started formulation three years ago and we're releasing next week thank goodness but yeah that was that was a battle too because at every point people want you to or formulators want you to can we just add this emulsifier and can we just add this filler and this stabilizer and this extra layer of preservatives? And, and we just didn't want to compromise. We just didn't want to be, you know, figuring out that, I mean, why even, as you said, it's, it's a massive, massive industry. I don't want to just throw more ordinary junk at this industry. Mm -hmm. If we're not going to do it properly, don't even bother. Um, So we worked hard at, you know, not doing it as per how most stuff is done now and not making any compromises so it's it's come mm. together but um yeah doing that with her has been great 
as you know, Kitty very well, she's a bullet gate and I'm more the OCD details person over here and, you know, we fill each other's gaps. So it's, it's good fun. It's a good partnership. Ooh. So I guess like this, uh, both of us as health coaches, nutritionists, we've been working with people and one of the things that will come up is like the condition of their skin and what foods, diet, lifestyle changes we can prescribe or coach them with to overcome these issues. So I'd like today to talk about various skin issues and what they actually mean because I think we have, I think the modern way of dealing with skin issues is to deal with them from the outside. Mm. And um, my experience as well when I was a child because I was a celiac and... But we were so skinny, this little skinny Sri Lankan kids, and then the doctor told my mum to fatten us up and put us on grains, you know. The, the like you would a cow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly, pretty much. <laughs> so all of a sudden we'd gone from eating this pure Asian diet of, you know, rice That'd and broth amazing. and, yeah, the yeah. perfect diet. We just, we needed, we did need a bit more food, but we didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up. But that, we didn't need different food. We just needed more food. <laughs> So we went from this Asian diet to eating this gluten-based diet, basically, and then I developed... Um, oh, you didn't realise you were celiac at the time or the doctor? No. Oh. Well, when we were kids, I don't think it really was a it, thing. It wasn't right? really a thing, probably, yeah. And then I had this awful um, eczema and psoriasis all up and down my arms, for which they prescribed steroidal creams, which which kept it at bay, mm. Um and obviously I didn't find out I was celiac until I was in my 20s because it wasn't a thing. But um, it's just interesting, isn't it? When you have a skin condition, the solution is a topical application, whether it's acne, it's cellulite, it's, you know, ring, it's yeah. whatever it is, it's like let's put something on it. Can we yeah. talk about why that just doesn't work? Oh, 100%. And it might sound strange considering we've just made a topical skincare line, but I don't see the solution for healthy skin being topical at all. It's definitely, I think what appears at the skin level is probably the very last point of a, a long chain of events going on, you know, either deeply rooted in the gut or something skewed in your hormones. Um, and the skin is just the last place for it to appear, Um and I think, A, if you use the type of products that are only going to suppress that, it's just an outward symptom of inner stuff. Mm. So whether it be acne and just throwing, you know, retinol at it or whether it be eczema and just throwing cortisone creams at it, um, then you're missing, well, A, you're missing that opportunity to say, oh, thank you, skin, you're telling me something. Something's not going on on the deeper level. So, yeah, that cortisone cream might, you know, turn that eczema off. But that whole chain of events leading up to eczema is still happening. And what else is that going to lead to down the track, you know, internally? So we absolutely have to stop and reassess the diet and look at everything right down to lifestyle and sleep quality and light exposure and everything else. Um, in saying that, when it comes to skincare products, there are still substances that you can use topically that don't make, uh, basically protect the skin from the elements and don't add to the aging process if anything it can protect and hinder that um, and soothe that outwardly and help rebuild the skin barrier and all those protective elements of skin so I think there's definitely a place for both but if you don't do both you yeah you miss that opportunity to get probably the best skin you can get mm. so they're all multifaceted and I don't think there's one short list you can say you know here's the best foods for acne and here's the best foods to you know, um, not get breakouts or, click, you know, soften your wrinkles. But for each one, it's an individual, which is why I, I work with people one-on-one, -on -one, generally three months at a minimum, um, and to just go back to blank canvas and figure out what's going on internally and read their collection of symptoms. With the acne, it quite commonly stems back to SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, but even that stems from something else. Was it originally hypothyroidism leading to lowered stomach acid, which allowed the bacterial overgrowth to occur, which led to endotoxin serotonin buildup and then accumulated estrogen and that, that sort of whole pathway, um, whether it be even stress-related, which, again, lowers stomach acid activity, enzyme secretion, you know, halters the whole digestive flow. Um, it could just be eating too many of the, 
you know, not so easily digestible foods, which tend to be the health foods, you know, of our generation, don't they? You know, the raw crunchy salads and the nuts and seeds and too many, you know, grains as well. Um, and, again, if food isn't digested really efficiently, broken down to its minute particles and, you know, the nutrition access from it, and there's too much debris or cellulose or stuff that can feed bacteria but doesn't feed us, Again, bacterial overgrowth and inflammation and literal ir- irritation and damage to intestinal wall. So, yeah, all those things we looked at to decipher what is the root cause of your acne in particular. Mm. And I rarely see you know, the same kind of thing playing out in more than a few individuals. It's usually a combination of things. You know, it could have been too many years on the pill. It could be. Gosh, and I, you even see now people when they talk about their health history, their symptoms going so far back that you realise mm-hmm. perhaps they were bait because born to Western dominant mothers and they had the brunt of the dump of estrogen from mum and then they, you know, they're on the back foot from day one, you know, it's menstruating far too early in life and then it was just that cascade that happened thereafter and perhaps they need support on that level, you know, for a long, long period of time. But it's... Yeah, it's always multifaceted, but I think quite quickly you can start to, when you bring it back to the simplicity of things, I think, and you start to go, hang on, let's look at the food we're eating. When I eat that food, do I feel calm, warm? Do I sleep well? I have, you know, I'm totally asymptomatic digestively. Things just seem to be going down and going through, no problem whatsoever. Generally, they're the foods that seem to be doing well for that person, but Generally, with the acne, I see a correlation with, yeah, digestive issues, absolutely. What do you think Did I go completely off topic? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. What do you think about, I mean, a lot of us would consider acne hormonal because it comes up in hormonal phases, especially puberty, premenstrual, um, you know, pregnancy, postpartum, menopause. Yeah. What are we looking at there when we're seeing acne in those kind of, especially in puberty, I guess, because it's a huge, huge problem. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And with all that growth going on as well and then the production of more of those steroid hormones, absolutely, the the building blocks for those are being kind of shredded through so much more quickly. So even when you bring it back to making enough pregnenolone to make your progesterone and your testosterone the good stuff you need cholesterol t3 and vitamin a you know they're literally the building blocks of it and vitamin a being so important obviously with what appears on the skin too and if you're using up you know the building blocks to generate those hormones but you don't have the vitamin a i mean how many kids do you know these days that are being brought up eating liver and sufficient eggs and lots of high quality full fat dairy i mean if anything they're being encouraged to have the diets of their mums who cut out dairy because it's cow pus and it's bad and inflammatory or whatever. Um, eggs might be occasional. They're rarely cooking liver anymore, you know, unless you're lucky to be still in a you know, Eastern European background or something and they're doing that sort of thing. But literally the amounts of vitamin A, like actual bioavailable vitamin A is so lacking, you know, in our in our current modern diets. So it's without those building blocks, you go through teenage years very differently than you might have 100 years ago with a more traditional diet, absolutely. And even in the healthy kind of states, right, like I'm still surprised by, you know, and this is no criticism to anyone listening, but the ideas of like what you should feed your baby, and mm. you know, we're going to do mm. an, we're going to do it. We'll go whole, down. We're going to do a whole episode on what we should be feeding kids and stuff like that. But you know, I, I started Shanti on liver was one of her first foods, and egg yolk. Whereas I'm watching most of my girlfriends, and no criticism to them whatsoever, because this, this is what they're being told to do by doctors and pediatricians and all that sort of stuff. But it's mostly a veg. It's a vegetable based. Mm diet um and I actually didn't feed my child any vegetables other than root vegetables she's only just now she's almost five started wanting to eat vegetables so I think it's really interesting like you say I was brought up eating liver on a traditional Asian diet until the doctor told my mum that I wasn't good for us 
But, oh, oh, shame. Yeah, no, right? But it was one of the first, first foods that I gave my daughter and it's just so interesting that, yeah, this is such a fundamental part of how we develop and how we all go through puberty and Definitely. all of that stuff, right? And it's not just what we do in those teenage years. It's what you've done as a two-, three-, four-year-old. It's, yeah. it's absolutely stems right back. I mean, it goes even back generationally, you know, what your constitution is going to be like. But I know I, that I did that for my kids too and I used to almost gag watching them how down bits of brown liver you know, not even hiding it. They were just inhaling the stuff. And yeah. I have pretty mine up with some nice sweet onion and, you know, <laughs> do nice things to it because I wasn't familiar to my palate either. But although when they got to three or four, they all of a sudden decided, mm, we don't like this anymore. I'm like, damn it. But I figure I got it in in those initial years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty formative and important. And perhaps one day they'll try it again and go, oh, this is familiar. I'll take back to this again. Yeah, so, yeah. But it's. I know you see what's being recommended out there and it's like, oh, God. And then we can go down the whole route of sugars being so terrifying for children and perhaps any for sugar is astronomical, you know, in the right forms. Low blood sugar, I mean, that's a massive trigger of stress too and we can, you know, bring that back to stress cascades as well and especially with Mm. brain growth and their brain is physically growing exponentially and what they're taking in every day and the brain requires so much glucose but what do we say we say sugar on kids is a bad thing and you know actually pull pull it away from them when their instinct is correct and there's such a push for like grains and legumes oh it is as well well i mean it's just i don't know i think you've got to look at each thing sort of individually and look at it for what it is and what it actually gives us and what it's made up of and go, does this actually make sense digestively? I mean, perhaps they're a, a famine food, you know, when you couldn't access the fresh eggs and kill the beast and you were living in a village in the, I don't know, middle of winter and they, they could be stored readily. And, yes, they're fuel to keep you going in times of need, but I wouldn't call them foods for thriving. Um but the fact that most people eat legumes and beans and fart, I mean, that's got to tell you something that maybe there's a battle mm. going on internally and they're not just supremely mm. digestible. It's, mm. But somehow they're put on a pedestal along with all your cruciferous vegetables and really gritty whole grains. And then other things that really discourage now, it's, um, yeah, but this is the battle we face every day, isn't it? trying to get people to think differently and oh maybe think back to what we were eating before and see if perhaps that was the way to go Mm. and so I think as well like coming into teenage years it's really interesting I have a few clients at the moment with teenage girls Mm. with hectic period pain and endometriosis and things like that Mm. and I'm seeing this earlier and earlier and um I think, you know, something we should mention here is like there's this, this huge prevalence. I, let's, I want to talk about junk food, and I'm saying that in air quotes, and how it affects the skin because mm. people think it's because of the sugar content. Mm. But let's talk about what it actually is that's driving these all kinds of health issues, but obviously we're focusing on skin today, and I think this is a big thing for teenagers, why they're experiencing such hormonal imbalances constantly eating from the tuck shop where mm. you know or and, and of course I'm not saying teenagers can't ever eat junk food like you're human mm. but you know we've just got to teach our kids to be in balance but I also want to get clear with the messaging that parents are giving their kids it's not the sugar in the junk food can you talk about <laughs> what it is, well, this junk is it. I mean there's so many nasty ingredients in a lot of these foods, but for whatever reason, we just pick out the cane sugar and go, oh, that must be the culprit, rather than, you know, all the industrial seed oils and the highly refined grains and the preservatives and colours and so many chemical additives. But, no, we demonise the sugar. And, and look, I think a lot of these junk foods don't even contain actual cane sugar. They contain multidextrin or, mm. you know, all sorts of other um, more manufactured sugars and um, broken down components of sugars, not actual sucrose, cane sugar. So why why is that the biggest baddie amongst a plethora of ingredients? We should look at everything else um, and look, 
definitely there's that whole conversation about poofers or polyunsaturated oils, but it's all cooked in these seed oils, which, I mean, they're literally these oils did not basically hardly existed before the Industrial Revolution. They're, they're so new to the human diet. And there's something that, you know, that correlation of cancers has only escalated since these oils became prevalent to us, whereas they say that apparently sugar consumption's actually gone down somewhat over those years. But, no, we correlate sugar with the cancer and not the other way around. Um, so looking at these oils, I mean, weren't, weren't even a lot of the, you know, chain junk food kind of um, food sellers historically. I mean, they still use tallow and lard and things like that to cook their chips in. And then all of a sudden they changed to healthy canola oil and healthy sunflower oil, which mm. was such a shame because back then they were probably, you know, decent potatoes cooked in decent fat. But, yeah, that's something I think it's worth every parent and person really becoming acquainted with and looking out for those oils and noticing how prevalent they are in, in junk food. Um, mm. And also, too, they're the cheapest of the oils. So they're not going to use good quality coconut oil. They're not going to use tallow they're not going to use um ghee and butter because they're much more costly than canola and safflower and sunflower mm. absolutely so it always comes back to profit margin but these oils are just so unstable and cause just catastrophic kind of uh, you know mess hormonally um again another reason for that endotoxin accumulation in the gut um you know in the elevated nitric oxide going on and then that creates the liver burden and that creates that accumulation of estrogen and then you yeah. know from there on absolutely that acne getting worse and worse and worse and of course yeah the- well exactly and like you said they're the years that perhaps even if mum did a fairly good job when they're little to feed them home cooked food and you know good simple stuff that's the age I'll start going out with friends and start getting more access to whatever food they want and it's sort of out of your control a little bit and so they'll go that's going to be more of those ingredients coming in I suppose um but yeah it's just worth I suppose instilling in them you know an appreciation for good fats and oils but like you said the goal we've got to live in the real world too and you're going to go out and eat hamburgers and chips sometimes and enjoy it not stress about it but perhaps that main meal of your day coming home to you know noticing the difference when you have proper food cooked in solid stable fats as well Mm. And um, the other thing, I guess, is the flip side of that is that if, again, we're having, because you can have what people look at as healthy oils at home and they're having more of a diet that's, you know, more kind of plant-based because this is like just being mm. constantly pushed at us now, right? Mm. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> constantly pushed us like meatless Monday, like, I don't know, all this kind of stuff. It's been kind of thrown down our necks that we need to eat less meat. Then the con, the the opposite of that, what happens is that people are then, again, going into the more legumes, a lot more vegetables, you know. So I can see I've had clients on the flip side who actually have skin issues and they're eating more of a plant-based diet can you talk a little bit about that yeah absolutely I mean you look at the cellulotic structure of the cells in particularly raw and undercooked vegetables but I mean cellulose being the cell wall of these foods um it's kind of like concrete to our digestive tract and we don't make cellulase that enzyme that breaks down cellulose so it's it's not something that gels digestively for us again more likely to feed bacteria and it will feed us unless you're going to do to it what your grandmother might have done, cook those vegetables to death, slather them in baking grease or butter or something, plenty of salt actually make them taste half decent or melted cheese or something, and those saturated fats are going to buffer, you know, a lot of those more irritating fibres, but also you've literally broken down the cell structure. So you've actually got half a chance of getting nutrition from within those cells. Um, so again, cooking methods are important because some of these foods can be, you know, they can provide some nutrients definitely, but they have to be prepared correctly so that we have a chance of digesting them. Um, and then coming back to sort of the animal foods, I mean, in, in plant matter, there is no vitamin A, like there isn't. There's, you know, beta carotene, which a very healthy functioning liver might be able to convert into bioavailable, you know, vitamin A. Um, 
But I'm seeing more and more women in particular with very compromised liver function and burdened livers that you got to hope that that pathway is actually happening in the liver. But if not, that beta carotene is very unstable and, you know, only causes other issues. So if you want the actual building blocks for youthful steroid hormones, you've got to find it in a ready-to-use format, which is generally, again, dairy, eggs, liver. Um, it's, yeah, it, and it's unsurpassed in liver. Like there's no other food like it. And then mm. you even talk about, you know, and you you would have the same thing talking to women who are thinking of getting pregnant or newly pregnant and there's that whole thing of, you know, must, must get in the folate, must get in the folic acid. Like it's just as paranoid. Quick, where's my folic acid supplement? I mean, there's no richer source of, you know, folinic acid or folate in, in liver. I mean, it surpasses your green veggies. Um, so it's it's just, I guess it's been well marketed, this whole push for that sort of vegan slant or, you know, vegetables are king. But I don't know, you've got to come at it with a critical thinking mind and going, you know, take the marketing away from it, take all the, the loveliness of these sort of, you know, clean diets away or whatever celebrities attached to it or whatever it is you pull to go that way and actually look at it for what it is. Um, a big turning point for myself, you know, when I'd, I'd already worked with clients for, you know, eight or so years and then just seeing that, you know, women in particular, they come to you with these certain issues and you'd recommend what's been recommended to you by you know, your lecturers at university. This is how you get people to eat and eat more salads, more salmon, take your fish oil, discourage the saturated fats and, you know, cut back on dairy, you know, the usual kind of more naturopathic approach, I suppose. Um, and you'd make the recommendations and it would sit well with them because they see it as, oh, that's what's generally acceptable as a healthy diet. So they felt good about recommendations and you, know, you felt good seeing them feel good and whatnot. But you'd rarely see them come back saying, oh, well, that was good and I feel that much better. What else can we do? That. I don't know, you just sort of wouldn't really hear from them again. But when I completely changed my tact and went this way, you actually see people mm. change and get better, like from chronic conditions. It was so thrilling. But that major clincher for me when I first had this epiphany was, um, again, I was, I was sort of going down that very vegetable-centric sort of method and applying it on myself because I figured who am I to recommend something if I can't attest to the benefits myself personally and I wasn't noticing benefits if anything and I'm very small framed I was shrinking terribly and I thought no and I don't need to lose weight um yeah I remember literally I googled the question who defined health food or how do we decide vegetables were so healthy because I started looking at them going hang on they're loaded with anti-nutrients they've got cellulotic cell wall they, they have all the elements that literally oppose digestion. Most of the nutrients there aren't in a form that the body can readily use immediately, you know, conversion to occur and all this sort of thing. And I started going, I'm just weighing this up. And you don't get much, you know, bang for your buck in terms of what you're getting from vegetables. And it, yeah, I was just starting to question everything. Google this one question and Dr. Pete's article came up. Uh, vegetables who define food I don't one of his yeah. very earliest articles and I just remember reading it and literally I could see fireworks going off in my head I went oh my god this makes so much sense and it was very you know controversial topic to be perhaps discouraging you know so many vegetables but it was the first time I read it so clearly put and just so just common sense and it was just literally again analyzing that structure of vegetables and going hang on how does that match with a human digestive tract perhaps it actually doesn't or perhaps we have to prepare it in such a way mm. that we can access some good from it but it needs preparation um and it's it's very interesting another another book I remember reading a very long time ago which still comes back to me quite a lot did you ever read the vegetarian myth yeah i love that book it's not good i mean i must say you get to the final bit she gives her recommendation on food and then she goes back to legumes and things which that's a question but i love the visual which i hadn't seen done in any other generic kind of mm. nutritional textbook even um she compares the digestive tract of humans cows I don't know, rodents birds 
and how incredibly different they all are. Mm. And here we are actually trying to encourage, you know, rabbit food to humans. We have nothing in common digestively. Um, a cow can thrive off eating grass and leafy bits, but they have to munch on that stuff all day long to get enough fuel. B, they read chew their cut a few times. I don't do that. Don't know about you. They have up to four stomachs. They secrete cellulase, which breaks down cellulose. We can't do that. They have a giant hind gut to ferment what's left, what they couldn't digest with all that com- complexity mm. that a digestive tract. Then they still fight a lot, but they have an ability to extract nutrients from grass that we can't. Then the, by some miraculous way, they can take poofers or polyunsaturated oils and saturate them, making them mm. stable. And then they secrete this beautiful milk, which takes the elements of that, converts them into more bioavailable forms. And aren't we lucky that we can say, excuse me, how can I please have some of your milk? It's done all that work for us. And we Mm -hmm. can access that nutrients that way. Um, The human digestive tract is so simple. It's so basic in comparison to most animals. But in comparison, we have a much larger brain by ratio of our digestive Mm -hmm. complexity complexity so then you start to realize oh so for us to access the best food for us perhaps we need to use this first whether it be to catch the food or prepare it or cook it or apply heat to it or do things to it to then ingest it and get the best from it whereas those animals with very intelligent digestion much tiny brains so they need that complexity so they can just like (laughs) eat the stuff that's right there and not do things to it anyway that's just my take on it but I loved that element of that book because it was just like yeah it's just I don't know all those clues are right there in front of us and we even just by you know looking closely at the types of enzymes we naturally secrete as humans there's all the clues there like we even secrete an enzyme that breaks down cartilage and things that Hmm, so maybe we're not meant to be vegan. Um, we secrete when we're healthy, lactase, you know, even as adults. So perhaps, you know, the dairy thing makes sense for us. Um, and the people who perhaps don't secrete so much lactase and develop a lactose, you know, kind of um, sensitivity, often that correlates to, you know, um, estrogen dominance and that downregulates that enzyme. But if we get our hormones right, you can make lactase again. So there's so many... Um, clues in our physiology if we will look closely at that and that's what I really got a lot from learning directly from Ray was that um most nutrition you know and I've been there and I've studied nutrition we just hone in on the food on the plate and we analyze the food on the plate and go oh it's got all this color and it's clean and it's got nutrients and it's organic and let's just push it in and hope for the best whereas he came at it from the total flip side he starts from the cell first Mm. looks at is what is required in those pathways looks at the digestive capacity the enzymes and then you match the food back to that as opposed to the other way around Mm. Mm. and which is why he's never called himself a nutritionist and he doesn't want to be claimed to be a nutritionist he'd rather call himself an artist and a biologist um and uh, yeah i really respect that because most people who claim to be nutritionists um you know, my label too, but it all comes down to the food at hand and what's going on in our bodies is secondary almost. Mm. And I think that's where this, the whole skin part is interesting, right, because the skin is part of that system. Of course, absolutely. And, this is, and we keep trying to do everything of this where you just take this one part, you know, and it's the same with like like a really common thing, right, for skin is to give up dairy, acne. Very. Yep. To give up dairy. And rather than, I mean, I don't, I'm really interested to know if you know where that idea comes from because so many people will say that their skin is better after giving up dairy. Mm. Um, But when we look at ourselves, just like Dr. Pete would, as you say, as a, who's a physiologist and look at us as a system of systems, you can really understand how a person becomes intolerant to dairy but when you look at it that way it's not the dairy that's the problem it's the system that's the problem well this is it and it's a it's a shame isn't it because I see those 
issue or issues when someone says, well, I started drinking more milk, my skin broke out. Oh dear, the milk must be bad, bad milk, cut out the milk, rather mm-hmm. than why is my system reacting so furiously to something so simple that show blow down the road can drink two litres of no problem? Mm. What's wrong with my system that it's not tolerating something so benign? Maybe I need to reassess and support my system better so I can tolerate it. But the most common approach these days is if you react to the dairy, just cut out the dairy and just just keep cutting things out rather than how can I make my system more robust that it can it should be able to tolerate freaking everything honestly I want that kind of system that it's almost like water off a duck's back and you can even have those random days where you eat something not so perfect but your body goes I can deal with this I'm so Mm. robust my liver function is so efficient um my immune system is thriving everything's so strong that it can tolerate more rather than actually fueling these systems that are so fragile and pathetic that all we can do is just keep avoiding more and more and more foods till we're down to a short list of this many, that's actually not going to encourage robust health, is it? Because, again, you're cutting out health food groups and you're missing out on all these potential, you know, you're not, there's no food out there that can compare in calcium levels. I mean, milk even has progesterone. Milk has so many good things that's incomparable you know there's nothing else that we can replace you know oat milk doesn't replace dairy milk <laughs> it's um there's nothing like it so it doesn't replace the joy <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't replace the joy. oh my god so what on no it? level is it even yeah <laughs> but this is it. i think it's just changing your whole mindset and your whole perspective because it's like saying all right i react badly to these three four five six ten said foods it's kind of like you're tiptoeing around eggshells and as long as you don't step on the eggshell you're fine no symptoms no pain whatever but one day you're going to step on an eggshell like you're going to trip up or you're going to be exposed to something and if you've just purely done nothing but avoid those foods for so long when you finally get exposed to it again which you will at some point um you're probably going to react even more so because the body's completely down regulated any enzyme related to that food because your body because you told your body we don't need this anymore so it said okay well, we won't make it then um instead of digging further and going huh okay so dairy makes me flare up what could be going on here and why again compare yourself to people around you go oh i can hear drink it no problem i can't perhaps it's a weakness in me it's not the fault of the dairy Mm. um and again bacterial overgrowth could be could be one element of it um which again bring it back to estrogen dominance which is just so prolific these days with women at younger and younger ages and again that relationship to high estrogen lowered lactase enzyme again you know if you address the hormone issue and the gut issue perhaps that lactase enzyme could kick back in and then when you did want to explore liquid milk again don't go gung-ho, don't try and be a hero and go and guzzle down a whole milkshake. You, what I had to do, because I'd avoided dairy for such a freaking long time, um, I literally did a shot glass of milk a day and I found the milk that tasted best to me because I felt that mm. that's the one perhaps my, I think taste is an indicator of what your body prefers. Um, shot glass a day for months. Then I worked up to a quarter cup, then a half cup. And by probably 18 months or so it took me, I could drink two litres asymptomatically Whereas as a kid, I would bloat with the smallest amount of milk and I was told you have a full-blown allergy to dairy and you'll never be able to have it again. Absolutely fine. I thrive. I get warm to my fingertips with dairy now and it's just, you know, and life's happier too, which mm. is nice. But I think, um, yeah, going back to the why am I reacting to that? Because it's not necessarily the food isn't the bad guy, you know, unless it's a really crap synthetic food. If it's just a natural food that most people seem to be able to eat, and historically, you know, people have eaten for a long time. Um, I'd rather help people look at why is your body so sensitive to something so simple and how can we help it tolerate this food over time and there's usually something deeper going on. And I think also with, with milk and sort of teenagers and things, just remember that with most high-quality dairy, it's such, it's it's basically a, kind of it fuels metabolism it elevates the metabolic rate Mm. which is a wonderful thing but again if you elevate the metabolic rate and you don't provide even more nutrition to go along with it you'll Mm. be ultimately in a deficit so it's like driving a beautiful sports car 
and you put the pedal to the metal and you take it up the highway. But if you have no fuel in the tank, you'll literally damage the engine. So when you, you know, if you want to have a high metabolic rate and eat the foods that elevate metabolism, it's almost like you have to commit to, I'm also going to eat more regularly. I'm going to eat more nutrient dense foods. I've got to really commit to eating the liver, the oysters, the things that have that much more complexity and and more minerals, more of the fat soluble vitamins and things like that to meet the needs of having a high metabolic rate. Because if you don't, you're going to show up with a vitamin A deficit Mm. acne. You're going to perhaps, you know, um, inflammatory issues might flare up again and eczema or things like that. So that's another another theory there. That's a really interesting concept too when you think about it because a lot of teenagers will just go to the fridge and drink bucket loads of milk and not be eating other food. And so... Mm. And I, you know, I was guilty of this when I was a teenager. I'd drink two litres of milk a day and not eat the other um, food too. For different reasons in our house that we didn't have enough food. But you um, you see that with a lot of kids and so then the, the parents go, it's the milk. You've got to stop drinking so much milk, you know, with the acne. Um, yeah. It's so interesting. And an interesting thought, I think, as well, when you hear about people who've gone pro-metabolic, I'm going to say that in air quotes everybody, <laughs> because everybody assumes that pro, going pro-metabolic is a thing. Yeah, and this is <laughs> short a short list of food. Yeah, yeah. One size fits all, yeah. And, so, and they just all of a sudden drink a crap load of milk mm. and actually this give themselves. This is it, and they might have had hardly any for decades. And then yeah. they go, apparently it's good to have a lot of milk and they're pushing two layers a day. It's like, no, no, be, be kind. Like allow your body to adjust and mm. you're making pretty – big changes all of a sudden that's that's a stress to the body too like if you're reintroducing foods that have been foreign for a long time you got to allow the body to adjust but we all we all want the quick fix and we all want instant gratification and we all just want it now 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 what those benefits right now the more the better um it's it's tiring and it's you've just got to consider it's been a very long time since i've drunk a lot of milk so let's introduce it little by little um and maybe in the meantime oh sorry Ray, I, heard, I heard Ray once say that it was good to have, like you said, a shot glass but with a piece of meat or mm, have, it, have it with a meal, not, you know, especially grass-fed beef. Yeah. Not on its own. And with own. sugar actually because mm. when you look at the makeup of milk, it's almost a complete perfect food in itself in terms of mm, nutrients and macros and everything. But probably in terms of the ratio of the macronutrients, is probably low on the carbs compared to protein and fat. So adding sugar to milk can make the difference to people who weren't tolerating liquid milk. And I've seen this, people who literally will turn into a chocolate milk or a sweetened coffee or just add sugar or maple syrup to the milk, mm. pinch of salt, and then you've got a more ideal ratio of everything and in itself mm. it becomes almost a fruitful meal. But, look, there's there's another issue. I mean, there's so, again, it's it's such a personal thing, but people who have, might have, a highly irritated gut and manufacturing too much serotonin at the gut level, um, they, you know, if they go for a predominantly liquid-based diet or they're just trying to guzzle down milk and orange juice because that's what mm-hmm. we're meant to do apparently, um, too much liquid can elevate the serotonin further without enough solids. So maybe it wasn't even just the milk per se. It was just that they're guzzling a lot of calories in liquid form and maybe they needed to 100%. You know, swap out some milk with some cheese or something. You know, it's some, it's so many factors, which is why I feel when I work with clients, I really can't help them make a profound difference till we've done a long period mm. of time together because it's all very well. I might, you know, give them some recommendations based on what they're doing at the beginning and let them go off a few weeks and put that into practice. But we really won't know what works for their bodies individually until we see the ramifications of those changes. And they might come back and go, oh, that made a difference, but oh, no, no, it doesn't sit well with me or, you know, suddenly my my period's regulating or it's gotten shorter you just don't know you've got to see how the body responds Mm. and then you make more tweaks see how it responds um and it and it really is yeah a very personal thing but the milk thing even to to if just say liquid milk doesn't go down so well for you right now or it really has um you know you're seeing an eczema flare-up or something don't cut out dairy entirely work at finding a form of dairy that you go well Actually, I can't do milk, and I've even tried goat's milk, and I've tried all the milks. None of them go down well for me right now, but they will in time. That's what we're working mm-hmm. towards. 
why not go to hard cheeses or something for a while and just you know experiment with a few different mm. cheeses see which one goes down well for you see see which one's delicious to you personally that's really important too it has to be delicious to you otherwise digestively you're going to be bored and you're not going to spark up saliva and enzymes and things um and you might go oh okay so i can still get the protein the minerals the calcium content of milk you know while i'm you know limited in my ability to digest the liquid milk for now and that's fine let's do that for a while i had a fellow a few years ago and he was um early 40s never had eczema all his life or as a child all of a sudden head to toe eczema he'd sit Mm -hmm. there on calls with me and he was just itching the whole time it was horrible i think it was you know stress and his gut had been through a lot i think there was some rounds of antibiotics and i don't know all sorts of things that happened for him but it was all of a sudden Mm -hmm. complete debilitating eczema and um he did notice that things got even worse when he touched milk So what we did was we went to town at looking at different cheeses and going, let's just see before we're going to cut out all dairy entirely because I could see he had this high requirement for calcium too and his stress levels were, you know, off the charts and I thought it would be really good to find a way to get dairy calcium into you in some form. Turned out uh, those hardened mozzarella cheese balls That was the one. Palmer's, he couldn't do either. I think there was a bit of a histamine thing going on there. But those those kind of cryovac sort of sealed Parmesan balls, um, you tried one of those one day. That went down quite well. He found it quite moorish. In the end, after several months, he could eat an entire Parmesan cheese ball um, a day and everything else. And on our last consult, he had one spot of eczema on his thumb. Everything else was gone. And he was able to eat this cheese, whereas previous recommendation to him was cut out all dairy entirely mm. because it's just the devil and the dairy is the cause of the eczema. It's like, no, 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 the dairy wasn't causing the eczema. It was something else. But let's find a way to get the dairy in still. And and that still worked. And I think you've still got to, you know, you've still got to experiment and explore and find the best ways of getting these things in and not just be so you know extreme as to cut out everything give up on it completely I think it's there is a way around these things because ultimately when you play with your diet and when you get into nutrition you're just doing a big chemistry experiment on yourself you know be be it good chemicals but it is we're playing with chemistry and you won't know the outcome of an experiment till you try something notice you know observe symptoms and perhaps you know, it might be something that make you thrive or it might be something that cause you issues, but you just, mm. yeah, you've got to kind of um, do these experiments. I think it's, the thing is everyone's so complex as well, right? Like, totally. I've never given the same instructions for one person, you know, as another person. Like I've had many no. people with dairy intolerances, I say that in air quotes, um, but I've never given them the same strategy to overcome that dairy issue. Exactly, exactly. So it's, you know, and that, and the stress is the big one, right, because especially when you're talking about teenagers, I'm so glad that I didn't grow up right now. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Teenagers right oh. now, I think, particularly, yeah. Yeah, and we've just been through, like, the worst, I think, you know, the last three years, you're in Melbourne that would have been the worst time to be a teenager, you know, apart from living in a war. <laughs> it would be the worst time to be a teenager. Um, and so we really have to factor in stress as an issue and this whole thing of, like, compare, you know, being a teenager is all about your tribal associations and, like, disconnecting mm. yourself from your parents and reaffirming yourself with other people outside of your family. So, you know, we're stuck in this whole thing of social media and compare and just compare and every, you know, plucked, sucked, plumped, you know, filtered person on Instagram. (laughs) You know, I think that stress for our kids is a huge, huge, huge factor. Massive. Oh, and even the parents of those teenagers, seeing them go through this and you you want to protect them from it, but how do you? disconnect them from social media and how do you or, or offer advice like no mum you're not cool mum um oh it's, it's yeah it's so horrific. much to it. I yeah. mean we're I'm, I'm kind of dreading what's going to happen for us when we're t- our kids are teenagers Emma because I'm already paying attention to what you have to do you know get your kids phone and 
check it every day and you know um, I had a great expert on the podcast Dr Christy and she was talking about you know make sure everyone puts their phone in the charging dock at a certain time to get a massive um, you know board and have all the phone charged there and everyone's phone goes there at seven o'clock at night and no one's allowed to touch it until seven in the morning like I'm even trying to keep that even now keep that rule (laughs) You know, because it's true, like when every time every client that I speak to whose teenager has issues, they're on screens till, you know, really late at night, like just like and this this hyper stress world is just out of control now. So I think this mm. is something, you know, that we can't take for granted. I think Well, it's it's the biggest thing. And the thing is, obviously my realm is food and trying to help people with food and nutrients, but if stress is chronic not even the food will cut it, you know, like stress is bigger than everything. You know, cortisol is what kills you in the end. You know, if if that is pumping, you will not be able to sufficiently make those opposing what we call the more youth-associated hormones. You just cannot. Cortisol will use up your nutrients. It will, you know, use up every bit of blood sugar you need to get to your brain. It will destroy your mood. It will, you know, literally catabolize your tissue you eat yourself up like it's just if you haven't dealt with the stress good luck Mm. trying to make changes just with diet like it literally is you know and we talk about you know skin and wanting to have more youthful skin and cortisol just you know rip into your skin and age you you know you see people who go through a massively stressful situation and they like age 10 years in a few months like it's just it's so important to address and it's the biggest factors. And I think it comes down to for each individual, what is that thing that brings you joy and gets you not thinking of checking your phone and just gets you giggling and relaxed and do more of that, you know. And it's for everyone, it's not meditation or a yoga class. It's it's so many different things, but we've got to find a way, and with our kids too, to try and encourage that, you know, try to make learning fun, not stressful. Try to uh, some somehow buffer all the things going on right now all around us and not have them bombarded with it and bogged down by it. They shouldn't have to be. Like remember us as kids, we just got to play outside and it was yeah. all pretty, I don't know, just there's just too much being thrown out. Don't and, come home till dinner time. <laughs> exactly. And have an adventure along the way and get messy and now it's all too oh, we're paranoid to send them out, paranoid to get them, I don't know. It's just, yeah, it's really sad. And how we navigate these times as parents is, I don't know, I just don't know what to do, but it's, um, I guess, taking it day by day. But, yeah, really finding those things that just, yeah, I think getting back to some fun, absolutely, because that's the only thing to really offset chronic stress and anxiety, you know, just a bit more lightheartedness. Yeah. So coming back to skin, I think eczema, eczema is an interesting one, right, because mm. I I mean, I guess I hope we've kind of touched up enough on acne for people like we can really look we'll at We'll go that. to as well, um, I did an article with Georgie, your listeners know very well, I'm sure, yeah. um, exploring quite deeply the topic of acne and I create a bit of a visual flow chart if you're more of a visual learner like I am, but, um, you know, perhaps put a link to that because I think you summarise things really well. But mm. maybe just as a last note on acne, just remember acne is not actually an issue of the skin, if that makes any sense. It's just an outward sign that ends up on the skin of other things at play, of other deficiencies, of other mm. chaos going on, just ends up out here as an end result. So to attack the skin and strip the skin and, exfoliate the skin and laser the skin as if the skin is bad and the skin's not behaving well it's yeah you're missing what's going on much deeper and and missing the opportunity to address a systemic issue before it leads into more mm. you know more, more chronic conditions um but not to not to, not to blame the skin for it I think it's interesting as well because I noticed like with women my age right so I'm in my 40s getting acne now and then there's all getting things like microdermabrasion and like all this needling and stuff to get rid of this acne and they're like come out of these treatments going my skin looks amazing all my acne is gone and I guess like I kind of 
scares me a little bit because I think of how that works and you've probably done a lot of research into this, but my understanding of those things is that the treatment, whatever it is, whether it's exfoliation, microdermabrasion, needling, whatever it is, damages the skin and then the body sends a stress response to the skin to repair the skin. So you're you're creating a stress. So you're actually irritating it further and then you're asking your body to produce more stress mm-hmm. hormones. Absolutely. 100%. So that just makes no sense to me. No. So then how, how, how often can we do that, Emma, before our face just goes, you know what? Even, um, <laughs> I was getting... Oh, there was a period of time last year. There must have been some new technologies coming out or something. But I got a few questions from clients about um, was it micro needling and all those yeah. sort of needling tools and things like that. So I was looking into it when people said, "Well, it actually does make my skin seem smoother." And like, how could it be a bad thing? When you look at it closely and how it works, and literally. I have to ask you to sit in the middle. Oh, Come sorry, on. sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm drifting off. You're drifting <laughs> um, off to the side. <laughs> Well, you, you, you're doing these minute little punctures. You're literally causing little tiny wounds, you know, evenly over the skin. Mm. But what that smoothness that results, you know, after the horrible redness and the whatever happens, the bleeding and everything else, um, you're just creating a smooth scar all mm. over your skin. You know when you get scar tissue, like yeah. if you had a really bad wound and you've got a forever scar there and it's sort of a bit rough and raised but it's got that kind of shininess. You know, at a lesser amount, you're doing that, but an evenly over the skin. So you might kind of thicken the skin and toughen it, but only because you've you've literally created a smooth scar all over your face. You've damaged you know. it. You've damaged it. Yeah. And it's, and it's just a healing response to the damage, but it's not like you've made your skin younger and you've made it healthier. You've damaged to emulate a shininess or a thickness. Mm. Um and it's it's warped, isn't it? Like it doesn't. It's so warped. It doesn't seem like a good idea. Again, what people talk about, oh, but isn't retinol the best thing topically? But how it works, or the more synthetic forms, is, is quite can be quite aggressive for the skin. And again, that's got its own concerns. But if true vitamin A is really that beneficial to the skin, well, I'd argue that it's beneficial, you know, every part of the body. Um, why shouldn't we just stop and look at eating more of it? you know, mm. getting in internally and then you get outward benefits and internal benefits and, yeah, it's um. It's well, I think it's the same for the, cause when I was reading with all these things as well, is that this, these abrasive treatments force the skin to make more collagen. Well, the collagen topic's very interesting. Right, um, so, and, and everyone's like, oh, wow, collagen, amazing. And I'm like, well, are you actually eating any collagen? Yeah. Let's and talk it's about not collagen. So- <laughs> Well, obviously, and with our saturated stuff, is you know, so that we we have our own collagen product that we source the best one we could find. Uh, I was seeing a lot of people get gut issues from using collagen powders, and anyway, long story short, we found the best one we think is available, and it does people good for their joints, um, their gut, skin as well. But it's not so simplistic, and I see a lot of ads going around. All these different companies doing their different collagens. There's a lot of them out there. And they almost make it sound as simple as eat the collagen, it travels to your skin and it sits there and it's your new collagen and the more collagen the better. But it's not actually the case. It's And I have to do an article and a breakdown of this and I'm, and again, I'm sort of a visual person but I, I think it's important to put to note that basically you've taken collagen. Collagen in itself is indigestible but we break it apart, we hydrolyze it to get these collagen peptides, the smaller particles. And it's these peptides, the amino acids that are so rich in collagen, which are wonderful. You've got your, um, you know, glycine in particular, which is so anti-inflammatory and so soothing and healing, and less of the tryptophan and the amino acids, you know, devoid of those, which is a good thing. It balances up your amino acids you get from the muscle meat. Um, And when you get these more anti-inflammatory amino acids, they help reduce inflammation and the things that damage and and probably um, disorganize your own collagen and damage elastin so anyway that's that's one interesting thing but also it's not that you want the more collagen the better in your skin think of it when you're if you want to make a really gelatinous stew or like a slow cooked meat 
you don't use the young sort of veal cuts and things, do you? Because they, that meat is so tender. It's actually got less collagen in it. When you want the really sticky, mm. you know, like the, the um, eox tail stews and the really um, gelatinous soups and casseroles you can make, you want those older tough cuts, don't you? Mm. Because the tougher the cut usually comes from the older animal that accumulated more collagen. Mm-hmm. But those, you know, the tougher and older animal doesn't look more youthful. It looks more wrinkled. It's more about you only need enough collagen. You want to um, basically manage the amount of collagen, but it's about organising the collagen. So the older the skin gets, it actually has too much collagen in some parts. You get these different collagen deposits. Just structurally it gets more chaotic. So the more collagen can actually lead to the more wrinkles. And, again, it's, it's yeah, it's a, we can spend an hour on it myself, but I've been trying to find a way to, to word it quite clearly and make distinctions because even still we want to eat the collagen, but it's not necessarily going to put more collagen in our skin. It's going to regulate the amount of collagen. Does that make sense? Mm. It's really, yeah, it's really quite fascinating isn't it so yeah. like making your skin produce more collagen at the surface level actually is going to make you age more but because yeah. we're so the attached more scarring. to this collagen yeah. is beautiful collagen yeah. is useful yeah. and beautiful well, everything gets dumbed down and simplified doesn't it yeah like, you know or you know like remember when they were dissecting more you know japanese diets and the okinawa diets mm. and things at the time and those bits going around and they're like what are they doing differently in their diet it means they've got less breast cancer or something Oh, well, they've got these soy products. Oh, soy must be good. So we go back into our Western Mm. culture and we go, if a little bit of soy is good, more must be better. Let's make soy milks or sausages, soy ice cream. And they just go overboard as opposed to looking at in context in that diet, they would have some soy, but it was generally fermented tempeh or something like that. But it was generally in perhaps, you know, like slithers of it in a fish head soup. And the fish head had the thyroid. And that soup was incredibly gelatinous. It had a heap of thyroid in it. So the thyroid would offset the anti-thyroid component of the soy. So you might get some benefit from that fermented soy, but it's in the context of all the other ingredients. Whereas we tend to take things out of context, don't we? We just let's take that one element. And that must be the key and all element. We don't have to think about it. Just throw it at it, um, throw it at the body and assume it's going to fix all our problems. Um, yeah. But the, the collagen is really interesting and what it comes down to is, yeah, having organised collagen and regulated collagen and not that level of um, an old haggard beast that has the leathery skin and the wrinkles. Mm. That's when too much collagen deposits sitting, sitting in the body. Mm. If anything, you want to, yeah, regulate collagen, elevate elastin. But um, it's very interesting. And then you see products which have collagen in the face cream thinking you can stick the collagen in your skin. Question, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I, I i dug quite deeply into that and from all the research i found there was no evidence that putting collagen on topically makes any different to skin quality or somehow increases or regulates your own collagen um at all so that's why i didn't put collagen in our topical product i'd rather you eat hydrolyzed collagen mm. It's so interesting, isn't it? Like Actually, also on my um my blog article that I did with Joe, the red light man. Have you ever spoken mm. to Joe before? Yeah, yeah. No, I haven't yeah. spoken to him, but I read your article. I do yeah. buy his yeah, red lights. Yeah. Well, he he reiterated that too in our discussion about about red light, and um I think towards the end of the article, sort of worth reading. But it's it's interesting when you look at the effects of red light as against blue light and different you know um spans of UV and how they affect skin differently but the older haggard wrinkled skin is shown to have more collagen we we discussed that there too and how you how red light has an effect and benefit as well that's so interesting right (laughs) Mm. and I guess too like you know people always think they take this one thing and they go I just have heaps of that but if you're eating all this gelatin and collagen but you're still only eating a thousand calories a day yeah you know, because let's face it, most of these women that are obsessed with their skin are also obsessed with their weight. Yeah. You're still going to cause that stress yeah. and free radical damage that's ultimately it's, going to give you the skin. That's it. It's just to and... come back to balance as well. <laughs> or the diet could actually look quite perfect, but the person is so obsessed and stressed about keeping that diet perfect 
and mm. someone asked them out for lunch and they oh but I couldn't because it was on the menu and I don't want to eat anything else apart from my perfect diet that I've measured and weighed and everything else yeah I don't know that person's living in a state of stress too and a what's the point of having perfect skin even if you did have it <laughs> you're not gonna I don't know enjoy it, it yeah. um, or you're just gonna keep pumping cortisol to override what good you might be able to manufacture and yeah it's all the things but but again you know stress and, and sleep quality oh my god I mean, is there any better skin rejuvenation or age reversal, you know, treatment you could have than a really incredibly good night's sleep, uninterrupted, unbroken by babies or anything, bed early? Uh, it's just, yeah, if you do that every night and get healthy levels of, you know, natural light, keep mm-hmm. stress down, you could probably keep diet pretty reasonably good without you know too many of the other details and be looking pretty good I'd say Mm. I guess the other thing with like eczema we're coming back to eczema there's a there's a huge I mean there's a huge thyroid component to eczema right thyroid um and an inflamed and damaged intestinal tract you know I'd Mm. sort of see the the integrity of the intestinal tract or the, the state it's in sort of comparable to that outward skin perhaps but yeah generally um when thyroid is low that generally leads to the intestine being more compromised definitely mm. and i'm not saying everyone go out and take thyroid hormone i'm talking <laughs> no no <laughs> the state of your supporting <laughs> your thyroid although in saying that you know 100 years ago we would have been getting thyroid in our food very readily mm. they would have used all the bits and leftovers in our sausages and yeah our chicken soup the thyroid would have been attached to the chicken's neck still so that soup was literally medicine like incredible stuff mm. but now by law the chicken farmers have to dump the thyroids either give them the pharmaceutical industry or destroy mm. them um we're not using all those bits so we don't or oh, and on top of that if they're not getting in dairy and things that have those sort of components there's no thyroid in our food and we probably need it more than ever before. Mm. We're just really on the back foot. We are on the back foot, aren't we? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think what I mean when I say about thyroid is making sure that you have enough protein, fats, carbs, calories, you know, eating at the right frequency. We're not and fasting, sugar. skipping meals and yeah, yeah. enough glucose. Well, if you don't, and that's it, and not and enough glucose. You Your thyroid predominantly makes as you know, T4, inactive thyroid hormone. But if you're going to make it into active stuff, what is that, 80% of that happens in the liver. And if the liver's not, the liver's generated and energised by by glucose and having, yeah, ample protein. And most women I see aren't getting enough enough protein. It actually Same. takes the concerted effort, doesn't it, to get enough protein. It's sort it's of huge. It's the, actually I hard it's work the for biggest the biggest and especially in the clean eating don't you think like yes. it's clean eating it's almost oh, don't you love that term <laughs> and i'm not talking about um vegetarians i'm just talking about people who say i don't eat any package or processed food i just yeah, yeah. eat natural food so you know so i'm just eating meat and vegetables and stuff they actually have really struggled to hit their protein absolutely it's um yeah it's sort of a chronic thing and then i mean i think the added proteins can be helpful in that regard, particularly if they only have so much appetite and they can't force down mm-hmm. another steak or another bowl of chicken soup. You know, it's sort of limited how much we can get in them, but perhaps the hydrolyzed collagen and things like casein can be super helpful that way. You can just kind of spike your food with more of it. But, um, yeah, there's no getting away with a lack of protein. No. What about wrinkles? What about wrinkles? <laughs> can we really use a small lines of glitch? Why can't we embrace those? Well, you know, this is really funny, right? Because we're so bloody obsessed with this eternal youth. And um, you know, I'm look, I'm not gonna be the one to say it, I'm just going to yeah, I I dye my roots, okay? They're grey, I don't like oh, them. So I'm not gonna say, yeah, you know, <laughs> exactly right. I'm not gonna sit here and go, you should just let nature take over and you know and I like to wear makeup and you know there's certain things that people like to do but at some point we've just got to go well you you are going to get wrinkles like it's part of Mm. getting older but do you think there's is there something that influences them getting them earlier is there you know 
because yeah definitely definitely uh, <clears throat> yeah I think it's the lack of all the the simple traditional foods we've been talking about all along absolutely um but I get again I think it's stress and sleep that's another massive factor but yeah that that sort of gelatinous component is generally lacking in our you know the current modern diet anyway it was something that everything was riddled with gelatin back in the day mm. you know we you wouldn't have gone to the butcher and just bought the lean fillet steak and the lean chicken breast you would have bought the whole bird and shoot the whole thing up you would have had the, the whole damn cow and the hooves and all the bits um nothing was really wasted or particularly in simpler kind of village life I suppose and even you look at traditional like French cooking um you know the saucier was such an important part of the you know the chef and his team and Mm. you would always have a beautiful concentrated sauce and it wasn't just using a kind of a grave ops powder it was a reduction of stock that was Mm. ended up getting thick and naturally because it was so you know so jelly-like and so gelatinous and naturally um have that thickness to it so that would always accompany the muscle meat. So everything was balanced out because muscle meat in isolation without the other bits, you know, the bits from the hide and the cartilage and, you know, the bone and everything um, is lacking that incredibly important glycine and proline and those anti-inflammatory factors. And, again, you know, when we start to eat more gelatinous foods, it's, it's that collagen we're talking about and regulating collagen um, is super important. So. If you're not going to prepare food in such a way to embrace those really collagenous bits, um, then definitely a hydrolyzed collagen or, a, you know, use conventional gelatin more often, you know, make jellies and panna cottas and gummies and those sort of things. But, um, yeah, I suppose addressing those key components that used to be in traditional cooking that just not there. Mm. Using all that stuff. It's a really biggie. That's, I think an interesting one too is stretch marks. Stretch marks are very interesting, yes. Um, I, but I think we've been led to believe that it's a given. Oh, well, you're about to get pregnant, you're going to stretch, you're going to have stretch marks. And and again, what fancy new creams out there that we can rub on that's going to prevent stretch mark like it's an outward thing? Yeah. And sure, keep your skin hydrated if it's feeling taxed and strained and all, but it's not, it's not an outward thing. I must say personally, I've had two pregnancies and both – I've sort of got a very small hip structure. Both my babies went way out. I was very large and they were very big in comparison to me. Um, and I don't have a single stretch mark, not one. So there was all the stretching going on. So it made me think there's more to stretch marks than just, you know, it's not just a given. If you stretch, you're going to get stretch mm-hmm. marks. It, it doesn't have to be the case. And I can't say I can pinpoint why I didn't get any and so many get so many. What is that key thing? But for me, um you know, I had done the work for a long time and I was eating more of what I found to be, you know, more complex and digestible foods. Mm. And I ate plenty of food through my pregnancies. And when I crave the gelati and I crave the cheesecake and I ate the cheesecake, um, yeah, so maybe it's not the lacking. I had done some natural progesterone leading up to pregnancies and things like that. So maybe I'd helped up my progesterone levels. Yeah, so I, I can't give a definitive answer on that, but it's I'd say it's more a preventative thing. Um, perhaps over time, yeah, more of the gelatin and things like that might help restore the tissue if the stretch marks have occurred. But, um, yeah, not. Well, what are your thoughts on it? Well, I think it is it is definitely to do with nutrition, really, and the elastin in the skin. And, I mean, surprisingly, my mum's covered in stretch marks. And so, you know, as the... I was always warned that I would. Warned. Uh, <laughs> um, and my mum was very tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny, and had enormous me and uh, my enormous brother. Um, for those like listening, my mum's five foot and I'm five foot nine, so we. <laughs> I was enormous baby too. But she was covered in stretch marks after pregnancy. Mm. And mm-hmm. I do not have a single stretch mark. Now, yes, Ooh. I've only had one baby, but I think that my, yes, I was doing, you know, I've been eating liver and collagen and all those sort of things for years. You could say that my mum was had that, but my mum didn't have a lot. She was starved a lot as a child and then mm-hmm. she was very stressed when she had us when she was pregnant. So she wouldn't have been eating properly. I know she's that person that doesn't eat, skips meals. 
Yep, yep. When you have been starved, I think there's a very there's a trauma response. So when you go into a, any kind of trauma as an adult, you can go back into that place where you just can't eat and stuff like that. So I think for her, very different. So I think my philosophy on it is, yes you know, stress and nutrition play big factors. Um, and those of you who follow me know that I've put on a lot of weight and lost a lot of weight and I still don't have any stretch marks or any loose skin or anything like that. Um, and I think probably losing weight slowly is a good definitely thing yeah. for that too, you know, like not losing more than half a kilo a week. Um, when you do you know, have a lot of weight to lose will stop you from having that. I mean, just, I mean, if you just think about the changes in fascia when you have an extreme amount of weight loss, mm. um, you know, um, but then, you know, you think about fascia and how copper dependent it is. And yeah, absolutely. Copper is an important factor. So, you know, whereas I want to have a diet rich in copper. So, and B vitamins and all that kind of stuff. So I think there's a lot to play in, in nutrition mm. in terms of, um, recovering from those types of things excessive weight gain and pregnancy and and stuff like that so I definitely got them when I was a teenager but I wasn't eating as well when I was a teenager um you know from when my hips got bigger I've got some stretch marks on my hips I've gone from a c cup to an f cup and I don't have any stretch marks on my boobs so wow yeah yeah. (laughs) just so and I appear to be saying that way annoyingly but um I think that I think nutrition had definitely has a lot to do with it, um, and preparing yourself. But like, you no, know, I was eating copious amounts of liver in my pregnancy, pre and during pregnancy. You always um, got to whisper that, don't you? I have to whisper it because you know <laughs> doctors aren't allowed to, and people would look at me and just some of the stuff I was. And it was like, no, this is this is what we're meant to be eating. You know, we forget in tribal cultures when a a couple was nearly married, they would be given all of the offal from the animal first before anyone else the in the bit. tribe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's like we want yeah. this couple to flourish and have continue our strong genes and create yeah. more healthy tribe people. So we've really got it backwards, right? Oh, so, and the nutritional recommendations given by obstetricians to pregnant women. Oh, Ooh. so scary. Behind. And the things that, oh, yeah, they put the fear of God in you that, don't eat any cheese that's remotely soft and don't touch dairy that's raw and don't have a steak that's a little bit rare and um you know you're gonna what you're gonna have everything overcooked and gray and 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 miss out on all probably some of the most important foods through pregnancy and not to say i'm gonna step on anyone's toes and override what you've been recommended at not there if you're pregnant but i think look into it yourself and be discerning and kind of use some common sense i don't know i think it's i, I just figure that I don't know, do you really think hundreds of years in somewhere like Switzerland in every little village, every time a woman got pregnant, they went, <gasps> no more soft yeah. cheese, no more milk because it's all raw, uh, well, don't touch Japan. it. No, <laughs> no more Japan. sashimi. If you had the no most sashimi. incredibly fresh sashimi and they go, all the women just stop stop eating what you normally eat. I, I, I highly doubt that. I just think, yes, of course, if you're pregnant, don't eat the sushi from the supermarket that might have been sitting there for two days. It's probably riddled bacteria. But. Even if you're not pregnant, I'd say don't touch the sushi at the supermarket. Mm. No one should, you know. The things that, yeah, I just, if there's, look, if there's, if there's the potential of your oysters could be contaminated or could be not 100% fresh, I wouldn't say don't eat the oyster. I'd say, A, get the freshest you can. B, why not make a lovely butter with garlic and parsley and parmesan and put them under the grill out and grill them yeah. and cook them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that way you can still get all the zinc and the incredible copper mm. and CoQ10 and selenium and where else are you going to get those things? So right. it's, again, pl- apply some common sense, um, get the freshest food available as you should anyway, you know, even if you're not pregnant. And, yeah. I sort of wonder as well with all these prenatal vitamins hmm. that everyone's taking as well because we do know, well, there are some studies that are looking into tongue tie, incidents of tongue tie and prenatal vitamins because prenatal vitamins are so copper depleting. Aren't they? Yeah. Well, but do you call prenatal vitamins just eating more liver and oysters? That's a good well, version. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm, yeah, exactly. So to they've, to, they've to, told us not to have our what would be our natural prenatal vitamins and Welcome replaced it. 
with a multivitamin, a synthetic vitamin that has ascorbic acid in it and, you know, not folate, what you, folic acid, folic acid. not the same. Folate. Folate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so now women are taking all this stuff. Like what is that doing to their skin when they're pregnant and, also, and their fascia? And- 100%. And, and every, there's no multivitamin or prenatal multivitamin out there that could have a true ingredient list as long as what you're going to find in liver and oysters and eggs and dairy. Like those foods you couldn't fit in a <laughs> a very thick book. The amount of not just vitamins but cofactors and other elements and, mm. you, you know, there's just so much in there, whereas even if your multivitamin had 50, 60 ingredients, it doesn't match, you know, the ends, like all the other magical components. Things we're only just discovering. Um how can you emulate that in a lab? And then there's the topic of formula versus breast milk and thinking that, you know, a tub of powder from China can come near to what is <laughs> in naturally occurring breast milk. It's just it's mm. full on, isn't it? And again, not judging anyone who's had to supplement with formula and whatnot and, you know, I'm sure there's better versions than others, but it's sad that it's, it's a time where, we're being told that that's just as good, if not better than, or more sufficient than what mm. the human body naturally makes. You know, it's, it's crazy. It's terrible, isn't it? A couple more skin issues we had on the list. One of them was, um, this from all my followers, listeners, mm-hmm. uh, yes, I've had quite a lot of questions. Well, dark circles under the eyes. That's mm-hmm. a thyroid. Yeah, thyroid. It could be a... Yeah, it could be an allergy too. It could be, again, probably stemming back to thyroid, absolutely. But I remember being sold, well, not so I wasn't sold, but someone trying to sell me a cream to get rid of the dark circles under my eyes because it was I was told it was pigmentation by this beauty oh. therapist. And doctors told me that too. And obviously it wasn't, it's just I had a low thyroid. But <laughs> It's interesting, right? We always go to that topical yeah. solution. Yeah. It's more um, money to be that way too, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, you're right. Mm. Um, melasma, this is a good one. Mm. Um, another thyroid one, right? Thyroid, um, yeah, absolutely. If iron and estrogen, although, yeah, melasma I'd probably put more so that sort of hormonal connection and then... Yeah, get some get some niacinamide in topically mm, as well as orally can do fantastic things. Yeah, and we'll talk about that too in the second with the skin, the skincare. But um, yeah, I think that the key thing, right, is that all these things are just screaming out like mm. body screaming. Help Your body's me. communicating. Help me. Your body Help never me. lies. Exactly. And I and I do and I know it's oh, and I've got like I can't imagine having things like full-blown rosacea or horrendous, you know, raw, itchy, burning eczema and things like that. But all these things, yeah, it's your body communicating. It's telling you it's struggling at a deeper level and we should see those signs and go, oh, thanks, body, for being so good at communicating. I yeah. should address that. Or should I? Let's look into this. Or let's try and take out some shit that doesn't need to be there and swap it with something better. Or maybe I need to say, take some time out. Well, maybe it's just your body telling you it's been stressed for far too long and you really do hate your job and you've got to reassess. I mean, there's there's so many things, but, yeah, something's, something's not working for you and something needs to be changed. And it's hard, right, because you think about how you work with eczema, think about all the, how many babies are just covered in eczema now mm. and how stressful that must be for mothers because there really aren't, there really isn't an answer in the mainstream medical no. world for eczema. Like, just yeah. Works. I see a lot of it is perhaps even certain solid foods being introduced far too early. Early, yeah. definitely. I mean that the baby's digestive tract, even once it's born, it's still forming. It's still, mm. it's still completely compromised and it's it's immature, which is why it makes sense just let it have its breast milk as you know feed on demand. But it's not it's not ready for certain proteins yet. It's not ready for certain foods. You know enzymes haven't aren't being manufactured completely yet and literally integrity of the gut wall is still still you know coming together um so to throw a peanut butter sandwich at it you know when it's a couple months old sort of yeah, it's probably not the best idea um certain proteins and 
you know, pretty common allergens and things like that are going to be, your body's going to react far more aggressively to these things. Mm. It's really hard. I, and I feel so like Emma and I have both been there, sleep deprived, everybody's telling you to do something. Oh, do, so much advice do this, do you. And you're just like, I want you to just take my baby so I can go to sleep. It's so, <laughs> so hard. Um, you know, so it's really hard in those times. But a big thing I want to come to is sun damage because this is something that's being thrown at us right now. And mm-hmm. something, I, and, I, and lipofuscin too, and I kind of bring them together because most people would confuse lipofuscin for sun damage. Mm. And it kind of is in a sense, but there's a reason why. So... And we're, this is being really pushed hardcore at us now, and I get that because we've had such a rise of skin cancer. And um, but and but now I'm seeing more creams being thrown at us with SPF and more. You know, everything's got <laughs> SPF. But fear now. the sun, don't we? We're so afraid of it. And I find it even hard just with my daughter at school. And, you know, I'm not having to go at the school because there's a government protocol and stuff like that. But I I find I have to pick her up from school and go and take her and stick her in the sun somewhere because she doesn't get any sun at school any now. Sun. There's a shades cloth everywhere. Pat oh. on her head. Like it's, you know, and it's interesting because I notice she sleeps so much better when I take her to stick her in the sun for an hour after school. Mm-hmm. this vision of me like my child like she's in a pot plant and just stick her in the sun <laughs> <laughs> mum goes inside and has a rest yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> just sit there in the sun darling no, mm-hmm. but, you know what what let's let, let's talk about these sunspots first that people have on their hand because I'm watching people now getting them lasered off you know mm-hmm. these aging mm-hmm. age spots and sunspots how are they caused in a nutshell, I see that it's that um, basically that culmination of too much iron often and the yeah. puffer um, and how, the, how they interact and that oxidation that happens. Um, the thing is, too, you look at those sunspots on the hand and people go, oh, I'll just laser them, problem solved. Those spots that are, you know, visible on the skin level, they're happening all through your organs. I mean, they're I all know. over. So just to laser them off, again, we're trying to distract from the body communicating, saying, oh, body aging rapidly, quick, or perhaps we need to dump some iron or we need to swap out the poofers for some stable saturated fats and get some vitamin E in and things like that um, and perhaps help lower that accumulated estrogen dominance with some natural progesterone, you know, reassess all our fats and it's all the things. But, again, just, yeah, burning them off is just not going to, change everything else going on inside mm. um and also too just to say oh we'll put on more sunscreen and avoid the sun i mean it's been shown that our immune system is stronger when we get no, we're, we're, we're you know we're, we're animals we should be out in nature we should be exposed to the sun and then we don't even build up the tolerance to the sun too if you haven't had enough for a mm. very long time you know that first time you go to the beach after a long winter everyone tends to kind of burn the first day and <laughs> You know, you spend two days trying to avoid it because you've done that sort of damage. But if you were to spend five, six months of the summertime, little by little, little exposure to sun, you get to that point, you don't need any sunscreen hat or anything and you just tend to not burn. So you need to also build up some tolerance. But, yeah, the lipofuscin and the age spots and that sort of pigmentation is, um, yeah, definitely can come back to iron accumulation and, and again, the poofers. And the poofers are shown to cause that that um that basic that degradation of the cells and that oxidation was it something like 23 times more readily than sugar ever will you know and people always mm. put that that pigment issue back to sugar and everything's blamed on sugar but it's 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 definitely definitely far more attributed to to the poofers mm. and so they were ingesting all of these poofers mm-hmm. And, even and we're healthy. rubbing them all over our bodies and then going out in the sun. And they're in the sunscreens as well, and as well as other horrendous chemicals. And, that's the, and this is the thing people don't, I mean, we did have Matt Blackburn come on and talk about this a little bit, but they're talking about fish oil, how much fish oil is being pushed onto us as a health product. Mm. Aren't, we, aren't we born with a fish oil deficiency? How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. I wonder how the, those Aborigines in the Central Australia ever survived without fish in the desert. Petrol. 
Uh, so um how how is fish oil damaging our skin well it's just pure poo fuzz mm. highly or poly unsaturated oils and i the, you know they've looked at some of the products on the market most of them are already terribly oxidized and rancid even before they're making the capsule my like rancid oils they're not stable to heat light and oxygen exposure you know they just degrade their you know, you look at the lipid, the, the fatty acid molecule, and they're missing those hydrogen bonds. So heat, light, and oxygen makes them skew and distort very quickly, and then you get that free radical damage, I'm going to put it that way, um, whereas your saturated fats, they're, you know, they're loaded with the hydrogen bonds, so heat, light, and oxygen doesn't, doesn't affect them, you know, so much, far mm. more protective. So, yeah, I think it's something really important. Like I always teach people, like we're using coronameter, to always look at your diet and make sure that your saturated fats are the highest. Yeah, definitely. Mono, mono the second, and poo for the lowest because you can't avoid poofa, but you just want to make sure avoid them, they're no. super, super low. It's awesome if you could keep them to three or four grand tops. Um, mm. But, yeah, and you have to have roast chicken every now and then, which you've got to have every now and then because it's so good. But yeah, <laughs> that, that can certainly throw it. But even still, you might want to roast it with a bit of, you know, ghee and coconut oil instead of roasting it in even in olive oil or something like that. Mm. So, yeah, so we're, we're basically putting all these oils into our bodies that are not tolerant to heat and then going and sitting in the sun and causing damage. What about these ones that we're actually in? It? And this is interesting, right? Let's talk about the commercial skincare world. And I think this is where people have to be careful because the whole plate thing is marketed. Like I remember when I turned 30 and I was getting a facial and the girl obviously pulled out my card and she went, oh, she's 30, so I now have to read the script to her that she just that's appropriate for women over 30 and she's tried to sell me all this anti-ageing stuff. And I don't know, like, how many of you have seen me? I don't have... I'm now in my 40s and I'm not I'm not boasting or anything, but I just think this is really weird. I don't have any wrinkles, any nothing, and this woman's trying to sell me anti-aging skincare. This was 10 over sure. 10 years ago. So the whole my point in all this is that the whole marketing, the whole industry is just marketed and it preys on the fact, like the health and wellness industry, that you feel bad about yourself. It mm-hmm. preys on that fact mm-hmm. that you feel less worthy and just more shit about yourself than we'll be able yep. to sell you more stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly the word. It preys 100% on, on the vulnerable and it's just to make you feel like, here you go, you're ageing, so it's going to be like this and it's going to be horrendous and you already look bad as it is. I mean, one of the 20-year-olds are getting Botox now. It's, I don't know, there's no, what's wrong with, I mean, yeah, your your skin's incredible, and I I'm nearly forty six myself, and I'm you know I don't have perfect skin. I've got signs that I've you know had broken sleep and had a few kids and the whatnot. But I don't know what's wrong with perhaps even embracing some of those lines a little bit. Mm. You know, so they've shown that you've smiled in your life and you've moved. You know, you actually have a forehead that that moves too. But it is hundred percent about preying on on our vulnerabilities and our imperfections and most of them on the flip side when you look closely at the ingredients these ingredients are pro-aging if they're loaded with PUFA I don't care Mm. how much vitamin C and retinol and other newfangled you know ingredients might be in there it's um these oils are unstable to heat light and oxygen exposure and will you know cause your cells to age worse so yeah, you've got to be really cautious of the marketing. What were you telling me before about how much it costs to actually make these? Oh, my products? God. It's mind-blowing. So as we're going through the formulation, I remember in the early days I was, I'm very finicky on the detail. You know, you see Kitty, Kitty is my business partner and she's the one, let's get it out there, man. You need to do more videos and put it out. And I'm, I'm not that type of person. That, that's Kitty and she's excellent at the marketing side and she's getting out distributors and she's doing all the big stuff that I'm not good at. But I just 
I'm just OCD on detail. So we'd be going through the possible ingredients and I'm like, I want this and I want this quality and I don't want any this and I don't want that. I didn't want all the interesting standard stuff, which made it hard for the formulators. But at the early days they said something like, where do you see your product being placed, you know, price-wise? Do you want it low-end, high-end, whatnot? And it's for them to ascertain how much they're going to invest in the cost of ingredients per tub or per bottle as per what the recommended retail price is going to be because there's a generally known, I suppose, extrapolation of cost price to retail price. You know, you might mark mm-hmm. it up how many, 100%. Um, and I said, I don't know, give me a, I, I'm new to this, I said, give me a ballpark of what would be your middle, upper range, you know, something of good quality. It's certainly not just your chemist, you know, supermarket shelf stuff, but it's got decent quality product in it that we're paying good money for. Um, but it's not astronomical, what would on average be the cost price of that product to what they sell it for? And he gave me an example that something like Le Mer or that, those kind of brands, that one in particular, it was costing them somewhere like $11, this was at the time, per tub of their product, and they were retailing it for something like 400 And they spend more on the packaging than they do with the ingredients. And then, of course, I'm sure they outlay a lot on whatever celebrity is going to endorse it and whatnot, but the markup is astronomical and and our product's costing us probably almost triple that <laughs> per bottle and they saw that as not a good business model. Oh, no, 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 you can't be spending this much mm-hmm. on your product because you're not going to make enough product. And we're like, it's more than enough markup and our, we'll figure out the cost of everything else and we'll just, Yeah. but there's, you know, and I can't generalise, there's probably some decent stuff out there and people are putting genuine heart and soul into it and not just trying to rip people off. But it's, um, I don't know, it's a lack of integrity and I, I think it's some people just see skincare as an opportunity to to make money and you can make it pretty and put a good slogan behind it. Um, sadly, people are vulnerable to that. Like you said, they make people vulnerable. So like, well, I better buy this or I'm going to look haggard and old and I have no confidence um, and they attribute your confidence to your, you know, how you look visually, don't they? So, well, it's really yeah. sad and scary. It is, because... but you do have to, as you would with food, you know, be discerning and really look closely at what's in things and question things, even question the makers, you know. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's, there's so many things in there and there's, I mean, even down to sort of endocrine disruptors and things that are going to have an effect on your overall health i mean there's aluminium components and petrochemicals and i your skin is a living breathing porous absorbing organ i I think a lot of people just see the skin as this outward leathery layer whatever you slap on it it just kind of Mm. stops there but it's been shown that certain things show up in the bloodstream and yeah it's 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 sad that we we don't appreciate the skin for what it is and go well done skin you're doing a good job pulling me together um and perhaps put the things on that are going to further protect it and support it. And this is, was a big reason I didn't, I didn't even want to call like, like our, our, our face cream and our body cream. I just wanted to call it a cream, like emulsifiers all brought together nicely. I didn't want to call them moisturizers because it's kind of like it's undermining the fact that healthy skin mo- moisturizes mm. itself, or yeah. it should. It's got these self working mechanisms in it it healthy skin will exfoliate itself mm-hmm. it will only hold on to skin cells till they're functional and then dead cells have a purpose too and then they flake off very gradually a skin that's malnourished that doesn't have enough vitamin a for example the skin cells don't hang around for long enough they die off too quickly they flake off too quickly so instead people go oh my skin's all flaky and it's getting congested i better exfoliate it i better do microdermabrasion and pull them off even quicker it's like, no, 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 what could you do to slow down the die-off of your skin cells so they are retained for longer? And that comes back to vitamin A internally. So, um, yeah, I, I sort of saw it as what what could we place on the skin that's going to offset um, environmental factors and it's going to support the skin doing more of what it already knows how to do well as opposed to let's just go in there, strip the skin, throw acids at it, rip it apart, and then replace all those lost beautiful oils that the skin can make with some manufactured ones. It's That wasn't the approach, yeah, we wanted to take. I think there's a changeover period too, don't you think? Like I've been using clean, well, I think we should touch on this too first. 
but we'll come back to the clean beauty thing. But the like when I stopped using shampoo, for instance, mm. and the whole addiction to you don't the, use it at all anymore. I don't. I wouldn't say I don't use shampoo. I use a hair wash that doesn't foam. Yeah, and lather and all that sort of stuff. So I'm more into products now that actually keep the oils in your hair. Mm. <laughs> and there's a there's a kind of like. A, and it was all part of this thing when I was trying to work out how do I just enjoy my natural curls instead of trying to straighten my hair all the bloody time. And what I discovered was that shampoo was actually ruining my curls. Mm. And so I had to go through this process of accepting, like, and it's quite addictive. Like you're in this thing in your head where you're like, but this, this, the shampoo is not foaming and it's not soaking mm. up and it's not making bubbles, so it's not, it's not bloody cleaning my hair. <laughs> Like, yeah, you sort of had to go through a few weeks of, you know, you get you kind of get addicted almost yeah. to that clean squeak, you know, squeaky. You know, like squeaks, yeah, and you're squeaky. We've been doing clean. it forever, so you attribute yeah. that to clean and it's doing its job. And when you do it, and you're like, well, it's shiny, it looks healthy, but where's the squeakiness? Like, like yeah, like you so I can imagine, fun. like, like I have. <laughs> The skin thing's been longer for me because I stopped using skincare when I was in my 20s. I use a, a, a skin, I, I just use jojoba on my face, right? So I've stopped using all that stuff a long time ago. But there's a process that you need to go through, right, where you you almost have to give up the addiction definitely, of everything's associated with that. And especially I think if you've been using really hardcore products, like yep. I noticed with things with petrochemicals in them, there's an addiction like the like people that use that red lip stuff, what is it called? Um, that pawpaw, the red one has got petrico- yeah. petrochemicals in it. There's a different one that doesn't have petrochemicals. And what I notice when every time I use lip balm, and I have to say I never need lip balm, but any time I have used it, it actually makes my lips drier. So then you mm. put more on and mm. then you have to put more on and then you have to put more on. And it's, I think, a lot You're of You're creating a dependency. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. There's even um, like we chose, we've got a very sort of simple cleanser and it's an oil cleanser, which I've only just started cleansing that way the last few years. And it definitely took an adjustment for myself. And even at the time thinking, how can oil cleanse? And how could it possibly mm. clean as well as a detergent? And all these foaming cleansers are ultimately when they're full of detergents. And, you know, even if they're naturally derived, they're detergents and they work by stripping your skin of all its oils, whether it be makeup and debris and gunk from environment and, you know, the dirty stuff, but it's also clearing away those natural moisturising factors that your body works really hard to make and it has incredible benefits um, mm. to keeping skin young and healthy and protected. So, yeah, you start, you, you initially it feels weird because you're not getting that squeaky clean, you know, dry sort of tight feeling after really cleaning and cleaning yeah. with soapiness. And in the end, the oil, you know, especially straight on dry skin, the oil kind of attracts the oils and helps lift the oils. And it feels clean without being stripped, without being squeaky. And at first you think, well, it actually, yeah, it does feel clean actually, but shouldn't it's meant to feel stripped, isn't it? Like it's, even though mm-hmm. it feels really good and your skin actually feels comfortable and happy from it, you still, um, it does definitely take time to get used to not feeling completely stripped like that. And, and maybe, again, acknowledging that maybe some of the stuff that the body creates on the skin level, oh, perhaps that's natural moisturiser. The body's already mm. making it. And when the body's fed well, it should make a lot of the good stuff. I mean, there's cholesterol in there naturally, which, you know, cholesterol is poo-hooed in the body in certain amounts, but in the skin level, in the cells of the skin, that's what is a definitive factor of, of gauging a person's skin age, you know, the more natural cholesterol in the skin old people have been found to have much less cholesterol on the skin than very young people and what do we do let's just rip it all off and start again and use this you know manufactured product to replace those oils how can we replace the oils that the skin knows how to make and then clearly some people make too many oils and then they get you know oily more congested skin but again that's an internal issue and how do we regulate oil production but we've got that right the oils the skin makes we should embrace i mean i don't wash my face or even oil cleanse my face in the morning because the oils that are manufactured through the night when you're resting that's the good stuff 
if anything, I a few drops of water and I push those oils around, you know, it might be more so in your T-zone and just sort of move them around and maybe top a bit bit of actual, you know, additional sort of of our, of our cream just sort of in those areas that don't tend to make enough of the oils just as that extra barrier as you embark on the day. But, it, um, yeah, the, the adjusting to, to A, less product and B, less, you know, of the aggressive product is is a big thing and I think a lot of people become so dependent on I must you know do my seven step skin routine and I've got a double cleanse and then exfoliate and then serum and then a moisturizer and then the sunscreen and it's like what well, please just like let your body do its thing a little bit let your skin it's far more intelligent than you give, give credit for um work with it not against it and perhaps you'll get far better benefits and mm-hmm. and save money I mean it's not time. I want to know how it's time. I don't have to do this. I think it has enjoyable too. I mean, you've got kids hanging off you, and you, what? I'm not going to. How am I going to? Yeah. You, know what, you run out of something. How do you keep up with it all? It's, it's just, it's just crazy. I have to say, I've got a bit of a funny, I've this fascination with Trini. You know, Trini. <laughs> oh, Trini. Trini. Yeah. She's hilarious. And I watch her do her face Ew. routines. I just like, and this is the thing why this is the new era where you've just got people doing stuff to camera that they've never done before. And she posted this reel yesterday where she like gets out of bed and she looks like rubbish and then, you know, <laughs> does the hand to camera thing. Oh, and then yeah, two minutes later, so she's like, look at this done. And she goes through all the products that she used. But it's just remembering though that she is a businesswoman who has a. Mm skincare line a makeup line and it, that's all she's doing is pushing yeah those products and yeah. she's also had quite a generous amount of work done like there's a lot of going on <laughs> you know like and we have to stop I, I love watching her for the comedy value you know but you can, you have to watch those those videos as a woman and like use your filter and you gotta use your filter and go do I actually want to s- sit there I mean that's her job Right, her job is to sit there and put makeup on and stuff. Yeah, that's not my job. I don't have that kind of time. So why am I going to get her sucked into thinking that no. I have to do that to look? And then yeah, a well, certain the skin, way and well, the skincare process, but also the makeup process and the amount of time a woman put into make. I mean, I'm not. I've never been good at any of those things, and I'm so. I'm just like jeans, t-shirt, a bit of mascara. I'm very ho hum. I should probably put more of it in, but I don't know. There's something about healthy skin it actually yeah. seems thin as opposed to this layer of goop like the mask on yeah yeah like what's oh isn't it lovely to see skin especially when it's even if it's got a few little you know discrepancies and it's it's yeah what have I noticed all like, the pump plumping the and, better the th- the better my thyroid health the less makeup I need yeah you know it. and, I, and, and again, I get makeup's that like, another thing isn't it makeup's just masking symptoms that we should be acknowledging yeah. so yeah if you're covered in you know dark under eye circles and you're losing your pallor and you're getting a bit splotchy and you're looking her and haggard maybe you've got to stop and go okay am I getting enough sleep am I eating enough food let's reassess mm-hmm. things um take some time out and and that should be your, your skin treatment as opposed to what other topical solution can I find and let's put an extra layer of makeup but in the meantime your body's aging rapidly on the inside mm-hmm. and you're not listening to it yeah, I think it's you know, and I don't think Emma and I are saying you know you shouldn't wear makeup. Like I no, think no, no. you should you should oh, express okay. yourself the how you know whatever way whatever. you want to express yourself. But I think or at least maybe give your skin some breaks in between. You know, if you do a lot of makeup, enjoy those days where you let your skin breathe and yeah, yeah sure, put it on at night and have fun with it. I'm sure I was better at that. But yeah, it's it's still still needs some time out maybe. Mm, I just want I hope what women can take from listening to this episode is like just being able to sit and listen to their inside Mm. you know rather than being so focused on the outside and because the thing is as well like you know all the stuff that we do to the outside it doesn't make us happy no you know but even to have skewed our perception of beauty you know if you look on social media the ideal perception of beauty is to have a contoured face with all your different methods or whatever of makeup and hair done a certain way and like there's just that perception and maybe we've got to rejig that as well it's like um I always think when I I started studying Chinese medicine 
many moons ago. And we had to learn some Chinese at the time, some Mandarin, which at first I found overwhelming, but then I really enjoyed you learning about the different characters, mainly for the names of, you know, the herbs and the herbal medicine and all the body parts and things like that. And there was a really old uh, TCM doctor that taught us the Mandarin side and he'd give us a story about all the different um, characters for the words. And he was showing us orange peel, which is pea, um, because it goes into a lot of your your concoctions and things. And he was telling us how to pronounce it. And he tells the story about it. And he goes, you know, this is wavy at top and it's like the the peel of the orange. It has these natural undulations Mm -hmm. and waves to it. And then he said, we use the same character, the same word for the waves on the ocean and how they do this. And then we use the same word again for the wrinkles on the skin, how it makes these beautiful waves. And I was like, wow, Mm. they're correlating wrinkles, which we see in, you know, the West as making us haggard and unattractive. And they're emulating them to, you know, the waves on the ocean and the natural undulations in nature on fruit and things like this. And, yeah, I really resonated with that. I thought, "Why, why can't we see a little bit of that as, I don't know, like an attribute and something mm. that shows, I mean, sure, if you're really young and you're seeing, you know, like really advanced wrinkling far too early, sure, you're doing something wrong, let's address that and you shouldn't need to experience that. But definitely over time, as you said, you've got to expect naturally some yes. wrinkling going on. And if you have a really happy life and you're smiling a lot, you're really going <laughs> to create those indentations which that why should that be a bad thing either but yeah to to fill all of it and avoid all of it it's like well that's not right either and over time you you see older people if they've done a lot of that I don't just because I've you know eradicated the wrinkles it doesn't make them more attractive I don't think Mm -hmm. what do you think it looks hmm. no I mean, I think that. I mean, I think there's a lot to be said for being too thin as well. Being Definitely, too thin. yeah. Being too thin and your face does start to look quite sunken in early on, and I think that you know, I don't want to be superficial talking about that, but I find it interesting that all these women who are obsessed with being so thin, like, well, if you just put on a little bit more body fat, mm-hmm. if, <laughs> you want fat in all sorts of places, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, you want your yeah. fat. Yeah. It, you would actually wouldn't be so wrinkly and have that yeah. look, you know. Okay. So we're so funny. We're just so messed up in our head about how we want to look. But let's tell me what's in your skincare because I've definitely noticed and I, I'm really excited about it because I've been using things like niacinamide on my face and, um, you know, I really noticed some differences in my skin. Good, good. So yeah, from yeah, doing that. So I'm excited that you've got something coming out. And um, not really like, not really, look, I'm going to agree and I'm going to say that I'm lucky and I don't show any signs of ageing because I know women will be thinking, oh, what are you talking about? You don't have any wrinkles. I don't. Um, but I guess what I notice is using different products will just help me with things like when I'm, train a lot you know and so I get really Mm. sweaty from training so I do get congested and stuff and I'm not I'm not one for like hours and hours of skincare I've just like I've just got back from the gym I've got to get into work I just need to wash my face really quickly so using things like nice in one I've noticed really helpful um and yeah so tell us more about your skincare and ingredients um well it's a very small little family product but it's just cleanser you know face cream we've got a lip balm and a body cream and that's it and over time we'll you know we've got a couple of other ideas but we didn't want to over complicate and I don't think it should need to be over complicated and I might be controversial to say but I I don't think you need separate eye cream separate you know night day necessarily um I think skin skin I don't think you need difference between man or woman um but I just wanted to make a universal kind of cream that just had good stuff that with additional ingredients that is generally shown to have a topical effect and support um, natural cell function, you know, uh, that would only make your cells function better anyway. So it's devoid of poofers. There's no polyunsaturated fats, no monounsaturated fats, just 
saturated fatty acids, um, you know, derived from coconut, whether it be the fractions of the coconut oil or the full coconut oil, which we've also got in the body cream as well, which being the most saturated of kind of the natural the natural fats out there. And, yeah, we've got things like niacinamide because time and time again it's just it's shown to be so beneficial topically. And I also recommend doing niacinamide orally, you know, just sort of as an ongoing thing. It's a good preventative to many things later in life as well. Um, certainly important energetically and to combat stress. Um, we've got citrus flavonoids like naringenin, which is wonderful. So I recommend eating marmalade and do things with your peels because it's loaded with that. But also they found that using it topically, it does have a protective effect against UV-induced damage, um, can help to reverse UV sort of damage. Again, it's from, you know, the peels of bitter oranges, which is really nice. Um, copper, which, you know, offsets the iron issue and is so supportive of elastin, like you said. Vitamin E, which sort of is a no-brainer, needs to be in there. That's a good antioxidant as well. Um, Co- CoQ10, which is one of the, the quinones, sort of, akin to vitamin K and the benefits that that can help to improve cell metabolism of skin cells. Um, Caffeine, which is really good at sort of preventing and softening sort of harsher wrinkles and things, Um, shown to protect against sun damage as well. Um, Yeah, and a lot of the ingredients we're sourcing it was funny, I'd mention it to the formulator and they'd be like, oh, that's a bit old-fashioned. Oh, I haven't used that for a long time. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I want old-fashioned. <laughs> oh, that's and so interesting. Yeah, they were often the things that were readily used, you know, 80-plus years ago and then kind of fell out of favour perhaps because they created synthetic ingredients that had a longer shelf life or had a bigger profit margin or for whatever reason or just harder to access. So we were getting... Um, like the camphor and you know even urea which is fabulous cholesterol cholesterol is actually probably in the top it's it's extremely rich in cholesterol our face cream which is derived from lanolin from sheep's wool um but i think i mentioned before when you note the cholesterol levels in aged skin compared to youthful skin the cholesterol Mm. levels just drop right off and it's actually shown that obviously you want to keep your healthy levels of cholesterol up in your body um that's another topic but if you literally apply cholesterol topically it actually helps the cells create more cholesterol and it emulates that more youthful kind of function of the skin um cholesterol was so hard to access and so expensive to get and that was a that took many months just to and and at first we were told no you can't get cholesterol it's not gonna happen so we know we're just very stubborn so we've got cholesterol in there um yeah, our lip balm is based more on full lanolin, which is a wonderful ingredient um, on lips. Um, and all, most, I mean, all these ingredients, whatever's going to be absorbed potentially into the bloodstream or swallowed from the lip balm is all safe, edible, and all has beneficial effects systemically, which was really important to me. Um, to the point that, like, our body cream, I designed it in a way that I feel 100% good about slowing it on my babies when they get out of the hot bath it had to be that good and their skin is so much softer and more porous too that you've got to be even more cautious what you put on your kids absolutely on little babies too so um yeah everything in there has been rigorously checked that it's not only safe topically for kids but you know would have you know accumulating benefits you know if any is absorbed as well well, that's always good to know, especially when you have young kids because they always want to use your stuff. Yeah, that's true too. Well, this is it. Everyone should be able to grab all of it and just whatever. You know, just in saying that, I don't think kids need anything at all, but if they've had a particularly long hot bath, you know, it does strip their skin. You know, I don't think they need long hot baths, but if they're having fun in the bath and leave them to it and mummy's like, I'm not going to interrupt your fun because mummy's having a moment. Um, but you notice their skin does look more strict when it's come out. So just to help support it um, immediately after a bath, but beyond that, I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? We're made to think that in order to have youthful, healthy skin, it requires these 12 products and this ongoing treatments and whatnot. 
and kids do nothing and have the most perfect skin. Most husbands do nothing much and have generally great skin. I don't know about, you know, your partner, but it's it's very, um, it's interesting when you assess the people who don't do anything and you realise, oh, it comes from the inside, you know. Mm, It really does. It really does. I hope. I'm, I'm so excited that your skincare is coming out. I can't wait. We've all been waiting a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it, makes, it just makes Same. us know how much I think how the whole process of making this, I don't like the word, anti-aging product has aged me rapidly. <laughs> There's so many challenges and I realised why most people wouldn't bother taking it on. God, and then yeah, we had custom packaging, which you can only do in Asia. That's the only thing we've had to outsource. Everything else is right here. Um, but, geez, we had, you know, the factory went to lockdowns and then they had religious holidays mm. and then they had typhoons and they had tsunamis and they had, like, what else can the universe throw at us? It's going to delay this. So that was, yeah, every challenge. Mm-hmm. But we've kept each other sane and we're like, no, nope, nothing's going to stop us. <laughs> so hopefully after all that it's worth it and you like it. But, um, yeah, it's, um, they know mean feet and I guess these things take time. So where can we buy it, Emma? Only on um, our Saturate little website, saturate.com.au, and we're shipping pretty much all around the world. But if wherever you are, if you're interested and, you know, can't seem to get it, just get in touch with us. But um, we're trying to make it available everywhere. We're not wholesaling at this point. We'll, we we'll just see how things go from here. Yeah, and we want to. We don't want to sort of double handle things because we're trying to make relatively small batch. Um, and we haven't used most of your in like it's only the products that emulsify with water that require a preservative as such. And you do need them, otherwise they do accrue mold and things like this. But those products we haven't used your traditional industry standard preservatives just because mm-hmm. I don't like what they contain. And other the down, you know, anything more powerful in that regard has it has its own downside. And I don't want that on the skin level. But again, we had to source more traditional preservatives and things that weren't readily available, and we had to test them and make sure that they actually were functional. Um, but yeah, so they're totally well preserved in airless pump, which was another measure we went to to make sure they don't. You know, although when you're based in a saturated fat, you don't worry about the oxidation level, so that's a good thing too. But I think to um, on sell and to retail sort of stores and other sites at this stage, it would mean that you make it then and then it'd be shipped there and you don't know how long they're going to keep it. Mm. We'd rather just make it and ship it direct and, you know, as fresh as possible. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Emma. Thanks for Melissa. all of your wealth of information, knowledge. And oh, I'm rambling I hope, on. <laughs> I hope lots of women just feel like they got some answers today and, and men and, you know, for your families, for your children, for yourself. And, yeah, I just hope people really learn to listen to their body and um, take care of themselves and clean out that cupboard of all those chemicals and estrogen yeah keep it simple skincare and try some of um, kitty and emma's new skincare from saturate well lovely to finally really chat to you definitely on the same wavelength which is really lovely and you yeah, will have to chat about more so about kids and things one day oh yeah we'll have to not to say i have all the general. answers on that my god gee that's a that's when you <laughs> think you've got it handled it i know Yeah, we'll come back and do another one on that. Thanks, Emma. Yeah. Okay, take care. I'm Lena Lutz, and you've been listening to The Body Never Lies. If you haven't yet, please go to your favourite podcast app and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. All the resources and references from this episode are waiting for you on my website, leelalutz.com. Just click on podcast and look for this episode. Now join me next week for another episode of The Body Never Lies. Thank you so much for listening.